me to be back. So, um, you know, I'm psyched to be to be here with you guys and really excited about your guys' potential because I remember being in that the same place and being really excited about the oceans and really excited about what I could do, but not really knowing um, really what the potential was. And it turns out that there's so many opportunities and so many cool things that you guys have in store for your future um, that it's awesome that you're here. And I am happy to be a resource for anybody. If you guys have questions about, I'll talk about sharks today, but if there's questions about other things that, that you guys wanna know, um, if you are thinking about different projects to do or internships or things like that, and you just want a sounding board, feel free to, um, to ping me, I'm around. Uh, I'm at Hatfield most of the time, but I am on campus for a couple days a week. So if there's anything I can help you guys with, feel free to let me know. So um, today I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing over the past about decade and then how I'm transitioning some of that work here at Oregon. Uh, and if you guys have questions, feel free to stop me in between. And it's, it's, it's sort of a, a talk that I've, I give to formal and informal audiences. So if you guys want to ask questions, stop me that's cool um, if there's things that are confusing or i'm not explaining anything well enough feel free to stop me as well um, just try not to fall asleep so a lot of the work i've been doing is on white sharks around the world and this is probably the iconic image that everybody thinks about when you say the word white shark um, and this is really what started people's fear and apprehension about sharks um, and that has been transitioned in sort of popular media to some of these more recent um, exploits. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this movie. This is called Sharktopus, um, which is possibly one of the best bad movies about sharks ever made. Um, so it is, if you don't know, it is a half shark, half octopus. Um, and this, if you weren't afraid of bungee jumping before, <laughs> you should be now. So this is sort of the way that, that sharks have been portrayed. And so my, my goal has, has been to use science to educate people and say that this isn't what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about how cool these animals are and how important they are to our ecosystems and our environments. Um, and by expressing that to people and, and hoping that people can appreciate them more, um, it's more likely that we can protect these animals. The truth about sharks is that, yes, they are predators. And these things happen, right? Sharks are have giant teeth. They are eating marine mammals. Um, and, you know, they're doing these explosive behaviors out of the water. And this is what people think about. Um, and that has led people to have this, in, in concert with, with Hollywood, have, have had this fear. But this is a normal, um, natural behavior. This is the same thing that, that we do every day, or those of us that eat meat do every day, um, or participate in every day. But we don't think about that. Truthfully, shark attacks globally are increasing. Um, and so this is just from the international shark attack file. And these are just time periods over the X axis and Y is a number of attacks. So you can see over time, the number of, of human attacks is increasing. But is that really the whole story? And so we um, wanted to look at whether there are other factors influencing the actual number of attacks. And so in California, um, most of the attacks are perpetrated by white sharks. And so we looked at just white shark data and we wanted to see, is, it, is our white shark attacks really increasing um, or is there something else that's going on that's, that's, that's causing this increase? So we looked at all these different activities. So different ocean activities that people do, scuba diving, surfing, swimming, and abalone diving. And if you guys aren't familiar with Abalone, abalone is a, um, it's basically half of a clam that sits on a rock and it's sort of delicious if you put tons of butter and tons of garlic on it. Um, and people really enjoy going to collect them, but it's a, there's a lot of interactions with, with sharks. And so if we look at the numbers of people doing those activities, which you see on the X here is the time and then on the Y is the millions of people doing those, is that the number of people doing these activities has gone up exponentially. But if you go back to this picture of what the um, attack rates are, attack rates have not followed that same trend. So if we put those two things together, what we actually see is that um, these are probabilities. So that over time, your probability of being attacked um, or interacting with, with a, a white shark or a shark in general um, has gone down precipitously. It's gone down by about 90% over the past 50 years. But nobody talks about that. People talk about how scary it is to get in the water. Um, but the truth is that your probability of having an interaction with a shark, a live shark in the water, is incredibly low um, and even lower every year. 
The truth is this is how we interact with most species of sharks. So on the top is a shark boat that I was on in, in Florida, or that was in, sorry, that was in Louisiana uh, about 10 years. There, there is still a shark um, fishery in the US um, down in the, the Gulf and the Southeast. Um, and it's highly regulated, um, but there still is a lot of, um, a lot of sharks taken uh, in those fisheries. And they're used to create products like these beauty products, um, cartilage, some of these, some of these sort of, um, they're kind of like snake oils. Um, I like to call them things that, that don't really have a, a value, but people perceive them having a value. Uh, and then I'm sure you're all very familiar with shark fin soup, which is a, uh, which is considered a delicacy in some countries, which has really led to the decline of, of sharks. I think on an average year about, uh, I think the number is about 90 million sharks are killed every year uh, in our oceans. So truthfully, this is how people interact most commonly with sharks. It's not being attacked. It's not having these scary sharks jumping out, eating um, bungee jumpers off the line. Uh, it's with these, um, with these products. So now that I've given you sort of the sob story about sharks, um, I'll start talking to you a little bit more about white sharks uh, in my research. So the work that I've done has mostly been in California, though I've done research other places. What I'll talk about today is California. Um, and just some general background about white sharks. They are live born. Uh, a female will give birth to anywhere from um, four to 14 uh, live pups. They're in the range of about 1.5 meters. So that's about four, four and a half feet long. Um, and there's no parental care. Um, they're born live and swimming and have to start feeding right away. Um, they go through this cool thing called an ontogenetic shift. So when they are, um, when they're born for those, those first few years, they're eating mostly other fish, cephalopods, crustaceans, other sharks. Um, and they do that till they get to about nine feet, uh, seven to nine feet. When they hit seven to nine feet, they transition, their dentition changes, they get girthy enough um, and their behavior changes so that they can transition into colder waters. And I guess I should mention that white sharks are, um, they're basically warm bodied. So similar to us, whether we regulate our body temperatures above ambient, they do the same thing. Um, so that allows them when they get big enough to exploit really fast moving marine mammals um, in really cold waters. So most shark species that are, that are um, that can't maintain a higher uh, blood temperature, can't be as active in cold waters. So when they hit this ontogenetic shift at nine feet, um, they're able to go into these colder waters and start hunting marine mammals. Um, gestation period is somewhere around 12 to 18 months, um, and their maximum age is probably around 70 years. And I put question marks up against a, a number of these because these are still basic things about these animals that we don't know. We still don't know um, you know, how long their gestation period. We think they live, but we know they at least live 70 years. Five years ago, this estimate for longevity was 35 years. So every, you know, as time goes, these things are changing because we don't have a real good way to, to lock the information down. So the most of the work that I've been doing uh, in California is uh, at a place called Tamales Point, just north of San Francisco, um, the Farallon Islands and uh, north of Monterey Bay here at a place called Ani Nuevo. So, for those of you not familiar, this is where San Francisco is here, um, and then LA is down here. So in order to, to attract sharks, we use a number of different uh, techniques. Um, and the first is going to these aggregation sites, sites, places that we know that they historically occur to feed, uh, to feed on marine mammals. And we use a decoy, so it's basically just indoor outdoor carpet that looks like a seal. Uh, and this is what the seal looks like on day one. And a few days in, that's what they look like. We go through a lot of zip ties. Because the idea is we are exploiting the predatory behavior of these animals in order to study them. So you go to places that they aggregate to feed, you throw a decoy out there, and your idea is to, shark, white sharks are very visual hunters. So they look at the surface to find that silhouette, and then they investigate it. And so that's what we are trying to exploit. We also use a little bit of marine mammal bait. And so this isn't the big chumming things that you see on TV where they're ladling just buckets and buckets of blood in the water. We use a really small localized scent from a small piece of marine mammal. And that's normally from a stranded animal that's washed up on a beach. Uh, this is a sperm whale down in Crescent City, California that had washed up on the beach and it had an entire squid net in its stomach. 
Um, and so we think it basically starved and wasn't able to feed anymore and died. So we take those, we, we coax the shark up to the surface with the decoy. We bring the decoy towards the boat because it's on a rod and reel. And then when it gets close to the boat, the sharks smell that little bit of bait and it allows us a little bit of time of them swimming around the boat, investigating it to take data. So we do photo IDs, which I'll talk about in a minute, some electronic tags, and then biopsy samples. And the biopsies are for, for some isotopes and some other things that I'll talk about in a minute as well. So some of the first work we did is to look at the movements of these animals. And so we originally thought that, that white sharks were this coastal species that were just here year round. So we put on acoustic tags. Um, have any of you guys, are you guys familiar at all with some of the tagging technologies that people use? Acoustic tags and things? So acoustic tags are basically like a, um, an underwater transmitter. And so you put these tags on the back of a shark uh, and this is, there's the acoustic tag here and it it basically sticks into the muscle on the back of the shark and it will transmit every 60 or 90 seconds. It'll say, I'm shark 64. And it'll transmit an acoustic signal that goes out about a mile. And then we have receivers placed throughout the water that will hear those tags. And so shark 64 swims by, it'll pick it up or record that information. And then we go out and uh, we download the tags, or sorry, we download the receivers. And so from that, we get an information about when the sharks are present, their residency around these receivers. And so these are just some of the data that we get from the acoustic tags. So this is just months of the year um, on X and then the detections per day. And the colors are just the sort of the cohorts that we tagged. But you can see that every year in the, in the fall and early winter, there's these big peaks in residency of sharks. So that was the first indication that these animals are, are there in, in central California for this very specific period of the year, and it happens every year. Every year they're back and forth and back and forth. But what we don't know is what's going on in these absent periods. So the problem with the acoustic tags is that they only have a range of about a kilometer, or, or somewhere between a kilometer and a mile. So if you don't have a receiver listening for them, it doesn't tell you anything about where that animal is. So we had to go with a, another technology called a satellite tag. The real hard part about working in the ocean is that you can't transmit information like a GPS signal through that air water interface. So you can't just put a, a GPS backpack on these sharks and let them go and have it record where the shark's been. You have to come up with some other way to estimate the position. So what we do is we put these satellite tags on that record temperature, light, and depth. And they'll stay on for six, eight, 12 months. And after that period of time, they'll pop off the animal and transmit those data. The key to this is the light level data. And if you guys, you've probably seen those like, um, uh, those, those hour clocks, those sand clocks that, that people would turn, they'd be on a, like a, a, a schooner or something back in, back in Christopher Columbus time. And they would always turn that over to keep really exact time. And basically we're doing the same thing. The reason they did that is because every, wherever you are on the, on the, on the planet, you have your own local noon. So the midway between sunrise and sunset. And if they knew when local noon was in Greenwich and they knew how far off they were from that local noon, they could tell where they were basically on the planet. So the further west you get, obviously we're, um, you know, our, our local noon is gonna get later and later than the east coast. And so by doing that same type of sort of calculation with the, the tags, we can determine more or less where these animals are on the globe. So it's sort of a tricky but like old school way to estimate positions of these animals. So again, we knew that they were there in the fall and early winter, um, but where were they the rest of the time? And it wasn't until we put the satellite tags on that we started to figure it out. So these sharks are moving off, co off the coast to the spot in the middle of nowhere literally a desert in the middle of the ocean. Some are going to Hawaii, and then they're all coming back to the California coast. And this happens every year. So these animals are, are, are making these massive migrations every year that we had no idea about. And so we started to call this, this spot the White Shark Cafe. Um, anybody have any idea why sharks would be going offshore someplace out in the middle of nowhere? Look for food. Look for food. That's one, that's one idea. What's the other idea? To reproduce. to reproduce, exactly. So that's why we called it the cafe, because we had no idea, but we figured the cafe was the kind of place that you could go hang out with some other people, or you could grab a bite to eat, because we wanted to leave it a little bit ambiguous, because we're still not sure. So the sharks are making these massive movements offshore. But what we've seen is that the population 
um, these animals that are on the, on the coast are coming back every year. And so that, uh, that we took that information and then we took some of those, those biopsy samples that we were taking from the animal. So when we put a tag in, there's a little, um, there's a little tube that takes a little piece of flesh off of the animal when, they, when, when we pull it back. And from those, we're able to do a, a genetic study and look at the relatedness of these different populations. And so what we found is that there's, right now, we identify six different, genetically different populations of white sharks um, it, uh, around the globe. So there's the east coast of the US, the Mediterranean, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, over in the western Pacific, so sort of Japan, and then the northeast Pacific, where we all live. So now we know it was this distinct population. The next question was, how many animals are we talking about? Are we talking about tens of thousands of animals, or are we talking about um, 10 or 20 animals? So in order to estimate the population, we utilized a, a really old method, again, called market capture. The idea of this is that you, you have a sampling period, you mark some animals, you release them into the wild. The next year, you go back, you take a, um, you take a sample again, and the and use the proportion of ones that you know from last year with the proportion that you don't know and from that you sort of shake it all up and you get an estimate out. So for us it was really cool that sharks have um, basically their built, built in marks. They have unique identifiers which are their dorsal fins. They're sort of like a fingerprint and these are conserved over 35-40 years. Um, so you can see that the, the notches on this animal um, on the trailing edge of the dorsal fins, so the fin on their back is unique and over a five year period that doesn't change at all. So we can identify individuals. Um, we first started this project in 1987 and we still have animals from that time that are coming back with a fin that hasn't changed in that period. So we're able to identify animals every year and from that start to estimate the abundance of the white sharks. Anybody have any idea how many uh, white sharks there are uh, on the west coast of the US? Ballpark. Thousand. Thousand. Anybody else? Higher or lower? Higher. Who says higher? Raise your hand. Who says lower? Jackpot. So there's only a couple hundred um, sub adults and adults on the West Coast, which is pretty crazy. You think about these massive predators. Um, but yeah, so the estimate for Central California was about 219. Uh, and then a few, there's been some estimates of other parts of population that, that put it around about four to, four to 500 is about the, about the number, which is pretty cool, which is, which is uh, a number that we're still wrestling with, whether that's a healthy population or that's a, that's a population that is in need of, uh, of recovery. Um, but we're working basically to, to come up with a trend of that population. So we're not sure if that's a good number or a bad number just yet. So, um, one thing about we found out about the cafe is that we know that the animals are coming back every year, but, but are all of them doing it? Or is it just some animals are coming back and other ones are, uh, are doing something different? And what we found is that, um, oddly enough, that males and females have a different probability of coming back. So males, every year they go out to the cafe, they come back, they go out to the cafe and they come back. But females do something different. It's only about a 40% probability that they're going to come back. So there's something going on at the cafe that males and females are doing differently. So we wanted to start to look into to what that could be. And going back to the cafe, these are sort of the ideas of either there, there's something out there to eat or there's something that has to do with reproduction that they're doing out there. So in order to understand what they're doing out, out at the cafe, we want to understand a little bit better of what they're doing while they're on the coast. And historically, our understanding of white sharks comes from, from this, from this moment where we coax the shark up to the surface and we try to tell what's going on with that animal for the rest of its life based on those few seconds. So um, you all can imagine that, that you took this period of your day, the day when you were standing in line to get a cup of coffee, and I came and took some notes from you and walked away and said, I can tell what you've been doing your entire life based on those few minutes of you getting coffee, right? It sounds ridiculous when you put it in that, like that context. So my goal was to, to start to understand what they're doing the rest of the time. And the only way to do this was either to go down there myself with them or to put something on the animals that allowed me to travel with them. So we put on a series of what we call biologging tags. And these are super cool because they take so much data that you um, can really start to understand what the animals are doing and how they're interacting with their environment. So they have, they have a camera. They also have um, um, triaxial acceler accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers. Um, accelerometers and gyroscopes like you have in your phone. When you flip your phone, it knows which way is up. 
Um, so it's basically, it's measuring these inertial forces so you can recreate the movements and the behaviors of the animals from that tag. As well as the camera, which tells us about how it's interacting with this environment, how it's interacting with prey or cost specifics, things like that. So we actually get to go on board with the animals without having to get wet. Uh, the other one we have is a stomach tag, which is this one, which is a tag that we feed to the animal. Uh, and that's a little bit different. I'll talk to you about that in a, in a few seconds. But just to give you an idea, this is, a, um, this is how the tagging works. It's, it's non-invasive. And so the goal is to put a tag on an animal without affecting its behavior. Um, so this is South Africa. So you see a shark come up. And then I just clamp it on the, uh, the dorsal fin. So that shark will swim around for the next two weeks with that fin on its back. After, uh, after about 10 days or so, um, it has this little metal release that'll corrode and pop off. And we'll go pick the tag up. Uh, and the shark will continue to swim on its way without um, being any worse for the wear. So from those data, we get a, a cool perspective of what the animals are doing. And so I'm sure all of you have seen some Shark Week show of a shark jumping out of the water for the surface, but probably not many of you have seen it from the shark's perspective. So you can see how fast they're beating the tail. Sharks are jumping out of the water. So we get an idea of how much force, how much energy it takes, how long it takes, their approach angles, things like that, how they're visualizing their prey um, when they're heading up to the surface to attack them. And this is sort of a breakdown of those, and I said it has the acceleration data. So this is, this is depth, and you can see this is the shark when it's, when it's coming up to that breach, and you can see this is basically tail beat frequency. So a shark goes from about um, one tail beat every three or four seconds up to about uh, six tail beats in a single second. So you imagine that it's got a tail that's about that big and it's, it's, it's able to move that thing six times within a second back and forth. And that goes from about two kilometers per hour up to about 20, 25 kilometers per hour in just those couple seconds. So cool stuff that we've never been able to see before. We've been able to see them when they're coming out of the water, but haven't been able to study how they're uh, how they get to that point. Because you're talking about a 4,000 pound animal that's accelerating three times faster than, than Usain Bolt is able to accelerate on a track. And they're doing it underwater. It's pretty crazy. We're also learning about some different behaviors that they're doing. So are any of you guys swimmers, divers, surfers? Have you guys ever heard that, um, that you can go inside the kelp and be protected from, from white sharks? Have you ever heard of that? So, there's, there's, there's been sort of this old adage that you can, um, you can always refuge in kelp because sharks don't want to go in there because they don't like to be constra constrained in there or whatever. But what we found was that's <laughs> completely false. Um, they're actually hunting in the kelp. And so you'll see some Cape fur seals drop down and blow bubbles. There's a couple down here as well. Um, and what they're doing is that they're utilizing, it's a totally different hunting strategy than we've seen because they're utilizing the kelp. Basically, they corral the, the, the seals into the kelp. Uh, and then when the seals are distracted trying to breathe, the sharks start to pursue them. So it's not the like ambush stuff that, that you see on TV. It's a totally different behavior, but it's only because we haven't been able to be underwater with them that, um, that we didn't know about it. And so we can see how they interact with their environment. So this is the shark swimming. Green is when it's in kelp and black is the line. And then red dots are where it sees seals. So it's a totally different. It's spending almost all of its time in the kelp, the place where divers and, and servers and, and, and folks thought that they were seeking refuge. That's actually where they're hunting. Um, a lot of people get angry at me when they see that. Um, so we wanted to look at um, how often the, we thought, you know, these animals are here to feed and they're going offshore, maybe to feed or do something else. How often are they actually feeding on the coast? And what we found out is that it's very, very rare. We only have one, um, one uh, evidence of feeding on the coast um, from, the, from the cameras, and that was actually on a hagfish. Uh, it wasn't even on anything very energetically valuable. So the other thing that we had was the stomach tags, and the stomach tag is a little bit different, it still has those accelerometers, but we put it in the stomach of the shark. And like I said, sharks are warm bodied, so um, when they go to gulp food, their stomach gets really cold from the cold water, and then as they, they digest, it heats up to, to their regular temperature, and as they, they continue to digest, they'll go up, up above their like, normal resting temperature. So we can tell when a feeding event happens. And so you can see from these data, this is the, this is the temperature data of the stomach. You can see this is the point where the shark ingested some cold water and then the temperature goes way up. Uh, and that's indicative of a feeding event. So after um, 
uh, I think about a thousand hours, we had only one single predation event in that whole thousand hours, which is really incredible. So we've got about 450 hours of video, no predation events. I guess there's a, on a hagfish. You guys all know what a hagfish, it's a slime meal, it's about this. They're super gross, but super cool. Um, uh, not terribly energetically valuable for a white shark. I think just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, um, and one from a stomach tag. So it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible that they're not feeding that often. But does that mean that they're not feeding on the coast at all? Or does that mean that they're feeding even less in the offshore environment? So we went back to some of the tag data to look at this. And so the, the satellite tags have these, these, the depth data on them. And so sharks, they don't have a, an air bladder. So in order to, to maintain buoyancy, they have to swim, but they also put um, lipids into their livers. So whenever they eat something fatty, it gets um, assimilated in their livers. And then the more, more um, lipids they have, the more buoyant they are. And so if you are a shark that, um, that's swimming off to the cafe, they do something that's very similar to like birds that you see where they'll, they'll, they'll power up, they'll flap up, and then they'll glide down. And they'll go up and then they'll glide down. So it's, it's really common in the animal kingdom for animals to use that as a strategy to, to conserve energy. Sharks do the same thing. So we, you can imagine that if you started on the coast where you fed a lot, you'd be super fat and buoyant, that when you did those glides, you'd have this really shallow glide angle. But as you got farther and farther with less and less food, that glide angle would steepen, right? You'd, you'd, you'd have less buoyancy, so you'd start to glide at a, more, at a steeper rate. And that's sort of what this is suggesting, that when you start out, um, you have sort of a light, uh, a shallow glide angle. And then as you go and your liver gets smaller, it gets steeper and steeper. And, and so that was the idea. So if they're not eating offshore, that's what we'd suggest, or that's what we'd expect to see. And it turns out that's what we do see, that as the sharks get farther off, their drift rate, so basically that, that angle gets steeper and steeper. So they're actually not eating that much offshore. Um, there's also this, this adage that you basically you are what you eat. And this is uh, and it's really true for, for, for us. So if you took a plug of you and you, and you looked at the, the isotopic signature in your, in your flesh, you could see the type of food that you've been eating. And we can do the same thing for sharks. Basically, we can, uh, sharks on the coast are eating a very type, a different type of food than sharks would be in the open ocean. So by taking a little plug of the animal and analyzing that, we can determine where they've been eating most of the way. So if you were eating on the coast, you'd be green. If you were eating offshore, you'd be blue. And if you were eating in the middle, or you ate, sorry, if you ate at both those places equally, you'd be sort of that blue-green color. Um, and this is just a different depiction of it. So we looked at the, type, the typical food that they could be eating in these different locations and said, if you were, um, if you were a shark and you were eating 50% half at, at all these different places, this is where you would, you'd be. You'd be in this blue-green color, sort of right in the middle. And these are the different isotopes, carbon and, and nitrogen. Um, and so we tested it with immature sharks that are only eating on the coast. And sure enough, yes, they look just like the coastal prey. They have that same signature. But adults, turns out that they don't. They have a signature that's a lot closer to the coast, but still has some of these pelagic or offshore um, species as evidence of prey. So what that tells us is that the sharks are um, eating offshore, but only a little bit. So even though we only saw a couple predations or a couple evidence of, of feeding, um, there's, they're doing a lot less of it offshore, which is pretty incredible. They're also doing this super cool thing when they're offshore. So now we know it's probably not feeding that they're going out for, but they're doing this super weird behavior. Um, and it's what we call rapid oscillatory diving. So, and this only happens in males. And so when they get out to the cafe, the males are, instead of doing this swim and glide thing, they're swimming up and swimming down and swimming up and swimming down, um, up to, or down to 300 meters about 150 times a day. So you can imagine it's not gliding, it's basically they're sprinting up and sprinting down and sprinting up and sprinting down. And females are not doing it. Um, and if you look at the center of that cafe, as you get closer to the center, the, the, the males spend more time doing it. As you get further away from the center of the cafe, they spend less time doing it. So there's something that's specific to the cafe um, that males are doing, but females are not, even though they're all there at the same time. Anybody have any idea what that is? Why you'd be doing that? Or why a male would be doing that? Supporting behavior. So that's sort of the idea that we've had. It is, it's sort of a, um, 
it's kind of like a lek. It's like a, it's like a uh, it's a display, but not the type of display where an animal sees it. It, it increases their probability. So you can imagine if you were uh, a female white shark and you are out in the middle of nowhere, and we know that some sharks release pheromones to to express their sexual readiness, but the the ocean isn't sort of uniform, right? There's these these it's like pancake layers, where whether it's temperature or salinity or um, or oxygen, whatever it is, it, it lays out sort of horizontally. So if you're a female and you release these, um, uh, these pheromones out in the water, they're not going to go up and down. They're just going to go sideways. So if you're a shark and you, a male shark, and you want to come in contact with that pancake that's got the female in it, your best option is to swim up through them, swim down through them, swim up through them, swim down through them. The more you can do that, the longer you can do that, the sooner you can do it, all those things, the higher probability you have to find a mate. So we think it's, it's, it's sort of like a courtship, but it's, a, it's like a, um, a, almost like a fitness type thing. You prove that you are uh, really efficient in, at collecting food on the coast, um, and you're, you're big and powerful, and you're able to, to search more readily for, for females. That's the idea. So um, just as the, a little recap of that, we think that they're feeding on the coast. They're heading out to the cafe um, to feed. And uh, just the, the, the summary of it is that the... Um, shark attack numbers are rising in general, but um, your specific risk, so for anybody that uses the water, your specific risk is going down uh, precipitously. Um, it's a pretty low abundance of, of sharks. We're still not sure whether that's a, a healthy population, a stable population, or that's something to be worried about. Um, they're taking these long periods of time when they're going off to the cafe where we think they're going to mate and then coming back to eat here. Um, but again, there's a big question mark because it's, it's really hard to figure out what an animal is doing when it's 2,000 miles offshore. Um, a lot of this is just uh, sort of us interpreting what's going on. Um, and then just to finish up, just to talk about some of the work that I'm doing here. So this is stuff that I've done in the past uh, and I'm currently doing, but I'm, I'm, my goal is to, to, to transition some of these projects up here. And so uh, anybody that goes in the water here, you know that there are sharks around and we're starting to see more and more sharks moving further and further north with climate change. Um, with the, the changing water temperatures. We've seen it in California, and I think we're going to start to see it a little bit more here. So my goal here is to start to understand how animals are moving with these changing conditions um, and find these different hot spots for white sharks here because based on tagging data, these are satellite tags and these are acoustic tag data, we know that they occur up here, and, and there's a lot of people that see them. And so my goal is to start to understand how and why they're using this environment up here. Um, I also do, um, I need to go through this stuff. Um, I also do a bunch of other projects. So if you have questions on any of these other species, I study mantas in the Indian Ocean and giant bluefin tuna, other shark species, um, billfish and things like that. So I've um, been doing a lot of this stuff for about 15 years. So again, if there's things that you guys are interested in or want to talk about or want to ping some ideas or you're just like, hey, I thought this was super cool. What are your thoughts? Happy to, to you know, help you guys out with any of that stuff. Um, that being said, here is my uh, email address. I have a, a just a sort of a, a Wix website. It's um, it'll be transitioned to an OSU website uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. So you should be able to just search for me at Hatfield, um, and some information would co can come up. But um, if there's anything else um, that that uh, you guys need, let me know. Um, and I can. Do you guys have a listserv for the group? Okay. Do you want to send me that? And I can send my stuff over if anybody wants to shoot me an email or anything. So um, with that, that's it. If anybody has any questions or wants to chat, let me know. Thanks for having me, guys. I think they make, well, so there's a couple reasons I think they make the news. One is that um, they normally happen in the summer, which is the low time when there's no other like, news going on. It's like this dead, dead time of the year because like, all the political stuff is out of um, everybody's on vacation, whatever. Uh, and the other thing is that there's, a, there's this like, psychology of it is that, that people have a fear of things that they cannot control. So way more people die from drowning at the beaches but that's something you can control because you can be a good swimmer or whatever, um, but you can't control a shark attack. And so people have this innate fear. And so that's the other reason that it's super popular to establish fear with people. Do you think there's an element that you can analyze in terms of sexual selection for the sharks, 
more fit are going to have that higher probability of being on top, so they may be more likely to get hurt or injured by boats coming by. Are the ones, is there kind of like a tapering off point of the ones that are too fit, in a sense, have a higher likelihood of dying? Yeah, actually, I mean, that would be really cool. So there, there have been a couple studies that have looked at, like, um, have started to look at the genetic relatedness of individuals. And that would be one way to get at it, to figure out if the animals that you see are big, sorry, sorry the, the big animals that you see um, contribute more heavily to the, the you know, the, um, the genetic population of, of sharks. The, the one problem with it is that their, their growth rates and everything is so slow. I mean, they're, they're, basically don't reach sexual maturity until they're in their 30s. Um, so would, it's, uh, it would be one, it, it would take some uh, serious time investment, I think, to look at some of those, some of those things. But there's definitely, um, you'll see a difference, you'll see a lot of little sharks with like big bites and like, yeah, boat strike wounds and all sorts of stuff. Um, and you don't see very, most of the like the really big sharks are just like perfectly clean. So it sort of gets to that where it's just like you, what wasn't there? There's a, isn't there some saying like there's uh, basically the idea that, that you, you can't be super bold and make it to make it to that, that age. You have to be, you have to like, yes, you have to be really good at, at hunting and all those things, but you also have to be cautious a little bit. So, the, so all the sharks that are in, so the Northeast Pacific, I didn't get into a lot of this, but the Northeast Pacific is made up of like Central California sharks and then sharks from Guadalupe in Mexico, Guadalupe Island. So they all go there. All yeah, so that's basically the Northeast Pacific population goes there okay. for as, as, as much as we know that all of the animals go there. So the animals that are hitting on the coast up here, heading up as far as like Canada and occasionally into Alaska, like they're, yeah, they're making all that movement out. Yes. Um, so if Me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I um, I am, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm just I so I I just started. I've I've been down in California up until right before the holidays, and I'm just getting it. So I'm just getting my my sort of like feet under me here. But I will be um, have opportunities for undergrads, for grad students, for everybody. Um, not not for everybody, but I will have hopefully have a lot of opportunities to just get involved in different projects. So I've got white sharks. I'm doing salmon shark work. Um, I'll probably be doing things with leopard sharks and other species around, as well as maybe tunas and other things regionally. And then I do have more like global studies that I do on in, on different stuff. So yes. So even though right now I don't have anything because I'm still just trying to get the lab set up, I will have I will definitely have opportunities. So as time goes feel free to check back in with me. And if I don't have something or it's not a species you're interested in, I'm happy to pass you on to somebody else that I do know. Yeah. The White Shark Cafe is in the center of a gyre, right? It's not. It's south. Um, it's, it's actually, the gyre's a little bit further north. And it's sort of like, it, it turns out that it's right on the edge uh, of the, um, uh, of basically where the equatorial current meet and the California current offshoots. So it's, it's this sort of weird spot. I didn't get into the oceanography of it, but yeah, it's a little bit south of Is that jar. Any, you said it's on the equatorial, um, would you say equator equatorial? It's sort of on this equatorial current boundary thing. Is there any upwelling going on right there? So there isn't, but what it turns out, that, so we just, we spent a month out there last summer, or the summer, I can't remember, um, uh, and, try, and looked at that and sort of looked at all the oceanography, and it turns out that there's some really cool, oceanography that's happening there that's so normally the way that we the way that we investigate all the ocean spots that we can't do is you shoot a you shoot a radar down and then you can look at like the first couple of inches of the water you can look at like primary productivity or you can look at like oxygen and all those things temperature um, and that's usually a really good indication of like what's happening but it turns out in the cafe all of that stuff all of that productivity is happening down at like 100 meters which is super weird um, so we couldn't see it from the satellites, but you, once you get out there, you, you, you run a bunch of, of, of equipment up and down, and you see that, that uh, this, there's an incredible amount of productivity that's down a little bit lower. But we're still trying to see how that fits into why they're there, because we know that they're not there feeding heavily. You're, like, you're basically, California Current is like, it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet in Vegas. 
where it's just like you've got all the food you could ever want. And these sharks are like, hey, I'm going to go hang out in the desert for six months. It's just weird that they would do that. So we're trying to figure that out. Even if there is some food in the desert, they're not really utilizing it that much. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, we have. So since, uh, since our estimate, or I guess my estimate came out, um, there's been a number of other uh, of population estimates from other places around the, around the world, and they've been in the same ballpark. You're talking about you know, somewhere between a couple hundred to the low thousand. Um, so it's, yeah, it's pretty consistent. So I think that likely that's a, that's a relatively healthy number. Um, yeah, we're just, you know, it's like, it's just kind of crazy because you think about like salmon sharks or makos or anything like that. You're talking about numbers in the tens of thousands, but this is only in, you know, in a couple hundreds. So this thing with a, a fair number of species, like pink butterflies is a good example, where like when they migrate back to their homes, there's areas where they will just like get, go out of their way to go around something, mm -hmm. like over a lake. And it's like, well, what are they doing? And it turns out they used to be mountain there, but their migration patterns change over the years, and now they just don't do it again. You know, like, they still fly around that mountain, even though it exists. Right. Is it possible that that could be something with the cafe? Like, there was some reason they went there in the past, and now they just keep going back, even though maybe the benefit is not more? So we, that's one thing that we've thought about, um, for some animals that head all the way over to Hawaii. So there's, there's, there, the, a number of females head straight to Hawaii and they hang out there and they come, they come back instead of going to the cafe. And we think that there, that may be in one of those instances where they were either going over for, um, uh, to, to eat, um, humpback whale, like placentas and things like that, that were available that aren't as, as readily available now because the, the populations aren't as, aren't as big. Um, but that's, yeah, you know, that's like, it's hard to say it's a, there could be, and we've tried to like recreate, yeah, what might have been here in the past, or what you know, what have we fished out that's no longer there, or you know, what currents have come through there and just happened to meet there, or you know, those types of things. But that, yeah, those are the types of questions we've we've been trying to explore. Yep. Yes and no. So it, it turns out that they. M the majority of them come back at some point, but they usually spend anywhere from one to f four years wandering out. And, and what we think is happening is that the, they, so they bulk up on the coast and then they go off and they either, um, it's either they, they mate offshore and they come in and they bulk up and then they go back offshore or they come into a bulk up and then they mate offshore. But then we, they, we think they just gestate out in the, um, out in the blue water because it's warm so that they don't have to take energy to keep themselves warm so they can move that towards gestation. Um, they don't have to compete with, um, with, other, uh, with other males or females. Um, and uh, they, they can just take that time basically. And then they take, we think they take a year off after they give birth in order to, to basically just rest and recoup from that. So that's the idea is that they're, they're probably doing that and then they'll come back. So we see the, the females, sometimes they'll come back every year, other ones will come back every couple years. Cool. All right, well, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to email me. I'll send my information over on LiftServe, but um, otherwise, thanks for having me. You guys have a great night.